the way that Tag Heuer is performing as a company, particularly not just on their marketing, but on their product development. Tag Heuer is just producing watches that I don't think that any of us really saw coming at this level. They took 2023 by the balls. They they they, they, they sat at the table and they whipped it out and said, "Look how big this is." 100. percent How grotesque! But you are correct. <laughs> Tag is not f- around in 2023. Yeah. Did not f- around in 2023. Yeah. What is up, Watch Fam? I am Christian, the curator of the Theo and Harris Vintage Watch Shop. My name is Sam, and today's episode is brought to you by IFL Watches. We absolutely love IFL Watches. Can't wait to talk more about them and their new release uh, later on. Uh, So today's episode is all about uh, growth. It's all about investment. Mm-hmm. It's all about the watch client being better served now than they have been in a long time, right? And that's mm-hmm. not just measured by, you know, how hard is Paddock working for your money, right? How hard is Vacheron working? How hard is Rolex working? But to see a small, smaller brand, a, a less uh, obvious brand, mm-hmm. Tag Heuer, kind of a mid-range brand, dump so much money and time and love into their collection, is amazing. And frankly, in today's thesis is that Tag Heuer is killing Tudor. And what we really mean there is Tag Heuer's growth as a brand in 2023 was just unbelievable. I think it beat most brands, <laughs> uh, almost all brands, really. This was totally you know, unsuspecting. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and yes, as their price comp, I do think they had a better 2023 than Tudor. So obviously you've been in this watch game for nine years, roughly yeah. 10 years. Yeah. My understanding from what I've been reading and, and just doing research for this episode is, is the watch enthusiasts have, have almost fallen out of love uh, with TAG in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, can you just walk me through that a little bit? Yeah. First of all, Cheers. salud, man. Electrico Tequila. They're not a sponsor, <laughs> but it was a buddy that gave me this bottle and it's absolutely it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I would definitely look for this stuff anywhere you can find it. It's unbelievable. It's like crack. Electrico <laughs> Tequila. <laughs> these chips are making, these pretzels are making me thirsty. So yeah, um, long story short, you know, Hoyer, before they were acquired by TAG, was, you know, kind of a, I mean, a cultural icon, right? You mm-hmm. go into the, into the late 60s and into the early 70s. 72, I think, you know, and you've got, well, 69 to 72, and you've got so much going on with the brand, right? Mm-hmm. They became a cultural force with their Carrera and then with their Monaco in the movie Le Mans mm-hmm. uh, uh, with, with Steve McQueen. I mean, it's just unbelievable what tag, like the, the cultural heights tag reached. And I think they did that twofold. Okay. okay? One, product development. Yep. Right? Uh, uh, the Specifically, you know, the Monaco, among the first automatic chronographs ever, yep. right? Uh, and that was a race. You know, Zenith calls them El Primero, the first in Espanol. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but all, uh, you know, but but they, but they weren't right. There, there was a real a contentious, you know, race there. Uh, and the, the point is, not only were they develop, were they were they were they advanced on product development mm-hmm. and quality, but their designs were, I mean. Bold and beautiful. Yeah. They were designing watches that I think were more beautiful than their competition. So not only was the quality there, the design was there. And that formula made Tag an icon. Gotcha. So much of an icon. I mean, and obviously Tag had their problems too later on during the quartz crisis, but so much of an icon that they did become prime for the plucking mm-hmm. when a conglomerate or when a larger company, uh, Tag, uh, wanted to buy them. Gotcha. Right, so uh, they they were acquired and then ultimately acquired by LVMH, which mm-hmm. is a major conglomerate. Right? Oh, they own uh, they own Louis Vuitton, they own they own Hennessy, uh, Hennessy of course. They own uh, <laughs> uh, Moet Chandon, Zenith. Right? They own they own everything. Lord Piana. I mean, uh, they own basically everything. The world. They own the world in a, in a way. In that acquisition, over the last twenty years, Tag has they dropped they dropped everything that made them successful to begin with. Mm-hmm. Right? They stopped producing cutting end cutting edge watches and technology. Gotcha. They st- I mean the quality never became bad, but they really stopped being a leader of the pack, mm-hmm. right? Um, uh, and, and honestly, like even the reliance on courts there for a while, well after the crisis, into the 2000s, was actually kind of lame. Gotcha. Like, there was no excuse for that behavior when you're a primo watch brand. Mm-hmm. Now, and, and I'm almost I'm almost done there, I know I'm rambling, but the, the reason why they were allowed to do that mm-hmm. was because the Tag Heuer brand was so strong that you can, they were able to kind of take advantage of it for decades. Gotcha. Right? When the brand is so strong, if Rolex became kind of mediocre tomorrow, people would like they'd still sell out. You'd still have a hard time yeah. getting one, right? You'd have a long time before that history was rewritten, before the before the wake got to the crowd, to the end of the crowd, right? Mm-hmm. So so Tag was able to do it. But now, for for again, whatever reason the market, uh, they've decided, let's go back to our roots. 
let's pick up where we left off. Let's produce incredible watches at the cutting edge, right, of, of design uh, in the sports category and, and, and in, in commensurate build quality, and let's reclaim the throne. Great. Right, that's the long way to answer your very short question. I love it. Well, I think, and also what every watch that we'll go through, which we'll go through in, in a second here, is is they they basically take these these initial designs yep. and they just built upon it. And in, in, in the, the the modern twenty you know world for twenty twenty three, right? Which I I love. Right. This is a Carrera, but this is not a reissue. Correct. Right. It's not a it's not no. a one for one carbon copy like uh, Audemars Piguet's fifteen two hundred two or or Patek Philippe's fifty seven eleven. I mean, those are virtually reissues. Yeah. Right. I mean. Uh, whereas, what about Rolex is a Mariner? Mm-hmm. It's not a reissue, no, right? I mean, I, I always say it's a it's a logical continuation of an icon. All right, it's a nice it's, way of putting that. Right. I like that. Right. It's, it's, it's it's the Mariner in a modern world. It's yeah. not a reissue. I know there's nothing wrong with reissues. But this isn't a reissue. No, this is this is beautiful. Right now, we're talking about the Tag Heuer uh, Carrera, uh, the 39 millimeter uh, chronograph. Um, they released this in blue and also in black. Which one do you like better? Starting uh, there. So it's tough. Like, like. I'm a blue watch guy, mm-hmm. right? I'm a blue watch guy. I love I love a blue watch, right? Because my date just was blue. But I will say. The black just reminds me. It's just so classic. I mean, it's, that's just that's so retro. I mean, my like, like my dad would have a hard time picking one because my dad would be like, yep. you know, the black reminds <laughs> me of childhood, but the blue is really cool right now. The blue is cool. The black to me is just a, I'll say a little cleaner. I love the brushed uh, chronograph sub- subdials. Yep. Uh, it just looks it, it just looks great. The other thing that I, that I love and and I don't know if you know this. Tell I was me. doing a little bit of research and I'm pulling out my notepad, handy dandy notebook. <laughs> <laughs> not not your phone. Like. Not my phone. Yeah, sorry. I learned. I read the comments. No, but the one thing is that that what I love what they did with the black is if you notice the date hand is at twelve o'clock, uh, which you will notice is if the chrono is zeroed out, um, it is blocking the date. Yeah, uh, that is actually a callback to when they first put a date on the Carrera. The reference number it, it was called the Dado reference three one four seven, which was the first Carrera to have the date window. It lasted for basically that first issue. Maybe it was twelve months. I actually don't know. And then they moved it to the nine. God, to get so it out of the way. Wow. So it was a, a a f up that they were like they they kind of just took it back uh, for this not reissue but this new watch. And, and I love that callback to oh no no we f this up. Um, but no, we're gonna do it again. And I think the purists, anyone that loves that initial watch, those initial Carreras, uh, I think are gonna appreciate that. I hope because I, I love do. That. I, I, I think, think it's a cool thing. I think it's incredibly cool, you know. And 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 there comes the conversation of like, okay, does the value of the callback, does the value, does the nostalgic value of the callback outweigh the lack, the lack of functionality, the obstruction of the date mm-hmm. window? I don't care. The other thing, I really don't. Like, the, I, I think I think that the design is just so neat. I also know that like it's actually incredibly odd and unusual and rare for one model in two different colors to have any difference in the actual. True, watch. I didn't even think so about that's that. So that's so interesting. interesting. Weird. Like comparing it to Tudor, there is no model. I, I, I can't <laughs> think of a model where color to color there's actually a fundamental difference in the watch. That's that's a fair that's point. That's weird. The that's other thing that, that I love it. I do enjoy it's about it. It's quirky. It's you're quirky. <laughs> The other thing is, is, and I know, I know, I know your answer for this, but how often is the date actually right on your watch? For me, for it's me, never right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know I if know. anyone put it in the comments if, if you actually change the date when you put a watch on that you haven't worn in a while. I'm curious to know. I think we might be in the minority there. Really? Yeah. Oh, like, that's not going to look great no, on I us. I have a date on. My date is on eight. It is the twenty eighth. Yeah. Uh, also, while we're at it, what are you wearing today? I'm wearing my new Reverso. I bought this watch uh, sitting on the watch. couch next to you, pretty drunk on a Saturday night, and um, it's a duo. Uh, so it's travel time, and uh, gray dial goes to salmon, and it's an 18 karat white gold. Of course, I'm, of course it is. That's all. Because I'm Howard. Uh, I'm Howard. I'm Howard. Howard. I, was gonna say, I meant to say. Uh, oh, geez. what are you saying? I meant to say. <laughs> no, you <laughs> delusional. No, gold member. Austin, uh, Austin Powers. Yeah. Uh, I think that this this watch is obviously incredible. Comparing it 
to the Tudor Black Bay. Uh, yes, let me just know, pull that up real quick. Where are you falling, Pat? So I think both watches are, are just done almost perfectly yeah. in, in a weird way. It just just done great. This, yep. The sizing's great. Um, obviously, if you for you, I would imagine you go Carrera because the 39 millimeters. Whereas I kind of like that the Chrono is or the Black Bay is 41 millimeters. Yep. Um, and also price difference is only a thousand dollars. Yeah, which is interesting. I, I lean towards the the glass box uh, Carrera yeah. in black personally. You know, so, so do I. I think that Tudor did an amazing job with the Black Bay Chrono. Of That's course. a great watch. Yeah. Right. And talk about as a Daytona alternative at 5,500 bucks, <laughs> and you can get it. It's it's perfect. And I'm sure many of you watching this right now are wearing that watch and and and, and proud of it, and you yeah. ought to be. Uh, you know, the, the only the only thing I'll say to give or to give Tag the lead here, to give Tag Heuer the lead is, you know. It, the, 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 there was more R and D that went into developing the new Carrera than there was to developing the the Black Bay Chrono, gotcha. and and you know, it was it was a it was a harder jump. This is a, I think it was a more difficult watch to design. Even just the, the the crystal effect, right? This layered dial, this 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 multi layered dial, you know, convex or rather con concave dial, um, you know, with this convex crystal. I think that that alone is amazing. I agree with that, and, and where I kind of flip flop here, and, and I, I don't know if you agree with this or disagree, is I when we're talking about Chronos, I, I, I lean towards the Carrera. When we're talking about the regular Carrera dates, I do lean towards like the Black Bay Fifty Four. Right. I think that that is I, that's where I would go. Yeah. When we're talking again Chronos, I'm going Carrera, but but when we're talking about more of a uh, a classic uh, Carrera date time only uh, time only watch. Yep. Uh, I'm going to lean towards the the Tudor Black Bay. So then let's jump into it, right? So then go over to those Black Bays, you know, and. and and let's compare them. Before we continue this conversation, just want to take a few minutes and talk about our sponsor, IFL Watches. Yeah, this is an unbelievable new limited edition release. It's the Cassioke Octo. Not only has the Cassioke as a model just become this really iconic, fun, you know, kind of robust watch from a brand that we all love, but this particular limited edition, this Octo, features this <laughs> just unbelievable hand-painted oceanic scene with coral reefs and, and this octopus taking center stage on the dial. Obviously, it's a little bit on the nose that the hand painted, you know, sea creature is an octopus, right, on the on the Casio because it's such a it's an octagonal, you know, watch. But I just think it's such a beautiful, neat watch. Um, I I'm a big IFL watches mm -hmm. fan. I love customization in watches, and I think that 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 IFL does it uh, in this category. Really, I mean, I'd put them up against the best in, in any category, any price point, um, proportionately, of course, because not only are they original, but their quality is just unbelievable. This is not my first IFL watch. I really, really love the brand. I stand behind them completely. Uh, as you guys know, and, and, and you stand behind yep. this as well, we're just really big advocates for having fun with watches <laughs> and doing things, you know, under, you know, at, at affordable price points, relatively speaking, in this crazy world, right, that are fun and, 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 they're, and they're interesting. And I'm really a big fan of supporting independent brands. And while IFL is obviously, right, modifying these Casios, um, it is an independent brand, right? This is a brand of passionate watch enthusiasts. And, uh, and I think they make the watch community better, right, every day. And, and because they're hand painted, each of these 150 uh, individual pieces are, are completely unique. Absolutely. I mean, these watches really are wearable pieces of art. So I highly recommend you head on over to IFL and make one of these your own. And if you do miss them out because they're limited and there's only 150 <laughs> and you just missed the boat, that's perfectly fine. I really recommend you take a look at their full catalog and, and make an IFL watch your own uh, because, uh, again, they're just, you, you're not really going to beat them at the price point. I mean, just period, period, end. So head on over to IFL and and uh, that's it. Thank you guys so much for today's episode. The Black Bay has basically two, uh, uh, I would say two, you know, or I would say it has two variations of one competitor. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, the, so the Black Bay is thirty nine hundred bucks. How much is the Aqua Racer? Uh, twenty eight hundred. So it's a thousand dollars less. Yeah. Right. So it's funny because on the, in the in the pre previous conversation in the Chrono conversation, it's the flip. It's the flip, right? Yep. Like the the, the 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 Hoyer was a thousand more, mm -hmm. and now we're talking about the you know the Hoyer being a thousand less than its comp. And the one thing I'll say is obviously a thousand dollars represents a hell of a lot more money when of you're course. talking about these lower price points. So the the difference here is actually it's actually larger on a percentage basis. Agreed. Um, now, what are your thoughts? comparing the two even just on the design level i mean i don't know the design on both these watches it's tough to say like they, they i love them both 
I really do. If we're talking about the Aqua Racer, uh, I'm leaning towards the Black Bay still. I agree. I, I, and I think part of that too is, and I think I'm biased when I when I was looking at making my first luxury watch purchase, I did spend a lot of time looking at Tudors. Yeah. I really did. I I, I would love to own one eventually. Yep. Um, I just I, I think when we're talking again, going back to the Chronos, I, I just feel like the the uh, the the Carrera just knocks it out of the park on really all levels. Yeah. Um, it's it's not more original, but but there was more thought into it for sure. Um, into the original ones and even into to this new one too. Right. Uh, I, I think that the that the Black Bay Fifty Four specifically, the new Black Bay, is. Um, I think it's fresher than the Aqua Racer. I think the Aqua Racer is a great watch and it's mm -hmm. super cool. And if you want a green diver, I recommend it. No it doubt. Sick. I think it's really fair priced. I recommend this watch. No, no fucking hesitation. Mm -hmm. That being said, I do think the Black Bay Fifty Four is more refined. I think that more time went into designing the Black Fifty Four. Okay. Now. The one Aqua Racer, which isn't is, isn't an Aqua Racer, it's called a Solograph. <laughs> it's, it's an Aqua Racer Solograph. This one, oh, this is cool. I think is sick. So now, so this watch, you know, this is a this is a, a an Aqua Racer, sure, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more that went into it, in my view, right? You've got this 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 solar powered Aqua Racer in titanium with a really cool color scheme. I like it a lot. This is an original design, yes, or far more original. Than the average Aqua Racer. So when we're talking about the Aqua Racers versus uh, the the Black Bays for the Solograph, I, Solograph, I would rather go that route. And, and plus, you save nine hundred dollars. Yep. Uh, on the Black Bay, when we're talking about the regular Aqua Racers, I I, I lean towards the Black Bay. And, and listen, I can understand why when someone's looking to buy a black a Tudor a Tudor Black Bay or a, or a Hoyer a, a Aqua Racer, and even they knowing the Solograph is the coolest version of the Aqua Racer, I could see someone saying, Yeah, but three thousand dollars for a solar powered quartz. No thanks. Gotcha. I can see that. I get that. I'm cool with that. Um, period. Uh, I still think the Tudor beats them, but this is a cool watch. It's it's unique. It it's cool. Job. I don't know. It, it's just it's sick. And and I think the best part of this conversation is is there's really no losing. There really isn't. It comes down to personal preference, of course. But I don't think that the, you're a winner regardless. Now going back to Chronos. Yes. Right. We did. We did, you know, uh, you know, basic icon versus basic icon. Yes. Right? When we did the Black Bay Chrono versus the Carrera. Mm -hmm. But there's a primo, right? There's a primo Hoyer chronograph. Talking about the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room. The Monaco Skeleton. Hoyer this year <sighs> reintroduced the Skeleton, the, 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 the Monaco, in a way that I don't think anyone ever imagined. Then not only did they bring in this, you know, Dark Lord history, or Dark Lord history was, you know, uh, after the Monaco had been released a couple years later, mm -hmm. were, Hoyer was having a really hard time selling uh, uh, Monacos. They were just they were just not appealing to the market. Yeah. So for an experimental run, they were like, yeah, PVD a couple. Yeah. And, and they built this history of blacked out Monaco's. Super expensive on oh. the market now. But now they had a callback, back to the callback life. Yeah. They did it, but said, you know what? We don't want to just reissue. Let's let's add a top, that history, mm -hmm. and let's do it in a skeleton. This, I think, was a stroke of brilliance from Hoyer. This is just such a fun play on a classic Monaco. Totally. In, in, in the best ways possible. The ones that, that's my favorite is the the black on black with the, the turquoise accents. Uh, it, th this watch is like this watch yeah. is just beautiful yep. and I think that you show up anywhere with that watch and it's like uh, you just look like a bad you really do. I think you're kind of a player. I think I think you show up at that watch and you're really, really into watches and you get respect with that. Do not underestimate the value of those words when it comes to the <laughs> brand Hoyer, Tag Hoyer. Yeah. Who has walked into a room and been a player with a Hoyer in a long time? You haven't been meaning yeah. a new one, right? Uh, no one's been a player wearing a Tag Hoyer in a long time. You walk into any watch meetup, you're a player now. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what's your favorite one? I know there was three released. One's gray, one's one's blue. You know, I I, I like the black. I, the, the black, black is, is the just craziest. it's so unique. It's the craziest. Uh, and I think for for eleven thousand two hundred and fifty dollars, I'd rather go this route than than look what was a Monaco's. Seventy-eight to eight thousand, yeah. uh, roughly, right now. Uh, I'd rather spend the extra money and go this way. I don't even think it's close. I, I, I think you need. Think cool. if you, you should really consider it. Like mm -hmm. spend the extra three, four grand. Yeah. I think go for it. And I'll be honest. Like I, I like I, it better I, than the Daytona. I, <laughs> I really do. You know why? Because I like watches that scream. 
I have a couple of like I've been in this for a while. Like you know what I mean? Oh, it's have like, you? You know what I mean? But like <laughs> I like that idea. It's like and that watch is kind of like uh, skipping the line, right? It's kind of yeah. like wearing it is almost like people. Not that you should be worried about what other people think, but it's also a good place to be. Like in in any collecting hobby, it's like if you can skip the line toward the middle, yeah. right, or the front, that's kind of cool. And if you could do it early on into your collecting career, that's amazing. Yeah. Right. I mean, listen, the beginning of the journey is a blast, but you know. The beginning of a lot of people's journey is semi-generic, and then you need to like tailor in and taper in, mm-hmm. or you just get a watch from day one mm-hmm. that's a, f- a killer. A, a killer. killer. That's a killer. Uh, I, I think that if you're going to spend ten to eleven thousand dollars on a watch, yeah. you, you should highly consider uh, this Monaco, the skeleton. It, totally. it really is just it, it's gorgeous. But the design's great. Let me hear the butt. There's f- one more. So this is my favorite tag that that was released in 2023. Uh, I I don't know if you agree or disagree with me, uh, but but the 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 skipper. The skipper's unbelievable. This is this is this is tag at its finest. This is this tag. is tag at its finest. I agree. To me, this is what I love about watches. This is this, this is the fun of it. Yep. The colors. Uh, they they had fun making this watch, yep. and and it's it's a great play on a, on a classic tag Carrera. I, I agree. I think I think um, that obviously you know I think Hodinkee when because Hodinkee made a version of this watch a couple of years ago, and I think that it was a cool watch, right? Um, I think it was great. I think Hodinkee gave Hoyer a lot of the confidence that they needed to mm-hmm. like push outside the box, yeah. and that's great. Uh, but I think that Hoyer actually did a better better job with their skipper than Hodinkee did with the skipper. I think the Hodinkee skipper is really neat. I really, really like it. When it came out, I totally would have got it for my dad. Like, mm-hmm. totally. But I actually do think the new skipper is better. I think the, I think the dial's better. I think the, the cases are better. I think it's a great watch. I think it's better. I think the crystal's better. I think everything's better. Gotcha. So, so it's more it's more exciting to me. I, I, yeah, period. So, uh, I think that Hodinkee played a pivotal role in Tag Heuer uh, realizing what they had on their hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we should all owe Hodinkee credit for that. We all should give Hodinkee credit for that. But this watch is unreal. This is just I don't know. This is gorgeous. I want I want this watch and and I want to do water sports. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I want I want to go on a sailboat. I've never mm-hmm. been on a sailboat, but I want to go on a sailboat with this yeah. watch. Hundred uh, percent. You know, wearing wearing a, a nice pair of boat shoes. Like yeah, I, I don't know. I just feel like you would feel like the skipper. It's like throwing a captain hat on. Yeah. Like I don't know. You just it gives you an aura. Totally. Um, and and to your point about Hodinkee and, and another thing that Tag did this year, uh, which I really loved, was their collab with Rowing Blazer. Yeah, this was this was an older Carrera model. Yes, uh, but they did it in cool colors. This is again, this is fun. It kind of reminds you of the Skipper in, in the sense of the colors. I right. think that you know, again, a lighthearted approach to a one hundred percent. And and again, to your point, probably Hodinkee kind of starting the, the snowball effect yep. with that. Um, I just think that this this adds to their just their, their phenomenal year in twenty twenty three. Yeah. Um, looking ahead into twenty twenty four, what what do you think is going to be the game changer that to kind of keep tag on this path? That's a good question, man. Like, geez. I mean, I, I wonder, like, I, I you know, I think that a bracelet, I think, is going to be big. Mm-hmm. I think that reintroducing a really high quality bracelet, almost like a third generation bracelet, right? Like, so a couple of Omegas are still on generation one bracelets, mm-hmm. relatively speaking. They're a little bit still bulky. I think that Hoyer putting a, a beautiful bracelet on their, on their Carrera, I think, would work. Um, not that that should be the standard, mm-hmm. um, but I do think people would really get behind it if it was really, really nice and, and really neat and well thought out, even as an add-on, I think that people would go back into the tag boutique and pick up their bracelet now. Mm-hmm. And you could almost create the same way Patek did with the green rubber straps for the Aquanauts. I think you could almost create a bit of a healthy, uh, but like kind of like rivalry. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I, I was able to get the <laughs> bracelet. Like, and, and that's you know, it's, a, it's a good way for Hoyer to make fifteen hundred bucks, but in or a thousand dollars. But you know, in a larger sense, it's a really good way to get guys in the door. Yeah. It's a really good way to get the make the news, make the watch news. Uh, everyone will write about it. Everyone will make videos about mm-hmm. it. It'll be a thing. Right? Like if Hoyer, if Hoyer released not only a bracelet, but also a little bit of marketing around it, uh, that'd be a great idea. Now, is it the only thing? No. I mean, I, I've been waiting, just like so many people, for the Monaco to be released in a slightly easier size to wear for a mm-hmm. lot of folks. Do I think that'll happen this year? I don't, but that's really, it's a really cool idea. I think that there are a lot of people, myself included, that would love to wear a Monaco someday. They're just kind of big. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that would be a good idea. Uh, yeah, I think that, that's kind of that's kind that's of where fair. my brain is. I mean, I would love, obviously, to see the, the Aqua Racer improved a little bit. Yeah, That's going to be difficult because it's at a really kind of competitive old world price. Mm-hmm. So to invest millions of dollars Understood. into the Aqua Racer, right, would, would 
make it harder for the Hoyer brand to continue to sell it at the price they're selling it at. Mm -hmm. And I think the price they're selling it at is one of the reasons why it's such a <laughs> successful model. So that would be kind of difficult, and I want to be fair. Uh, but those are the things. Like and Those are the things I could see them doing to make it better. The one thing that I'll add to that that I, that I noticed with the time-only Carreras is, is fun colors. Yeah. There's pinks, there's greens, there's blues, there's all these different colors. I'd love to see them keep that up. Um, I like the idea of, of, the, of the collaborations with Hodinkee or, yeah. or Rowing Blazer. I don't know what that next brand would be, yeah. but to see them continue that into 2024, I think would be uh, really cool to see. Um, and then on the flip side, knowing that we're comparing more more so to Tudor, uh, what, what do you think that Tudor should continue to do into 2024? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that you know, going back to the, the Heritage Chronograph, right now they have the Black Bay Chrono, but the original Tudor, the original modern Tudor Chrono. Mm -hmm. The Heritage Chrono, the Monte Carlo kind of reissue, and it's a beautiful watch. And I thought that was a great watch. That they really, that they really should uh, bring back and improve upon. Again, it was big, so I don't think it got the commercial success that it otherwise would have achieved. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a really good watch. There's no doubt about that. And I kind of, I mean, I kind of miss it. I thought that was one of the best tutors. You know, that watch in a slightly more refined case with a thinner bracelet, and boom, you've got a, you've got a winner on your hands. Mm -hmm. You've got a watch that I think is, you, you went from being like, it's good value, fifty five hundred to like, dude, chase it at 64. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. That's what I think. If they killed it with that, the watch world would totally bite. Right? We're so Daytona hungry in this watch world, and I think that these watches had personality yep. that the modern Tudor Black Bay Chrono doesn't have. And I like the watch, but it doesn't have what this watch has. And what's the one that you have in the shop? Because you have something very similar. I have the original Monte Carlo. I love that. Shop. Yeah, it's unbelievable. That's a, it's a that's watch. A, I mean, it's, a, it's a flawless. That's a winner. That's a winner. I mean, <laughs> that's it's a, a great flawless, watch. It's a flawless, you know, date, vintage Daytona exotic dial comp. Um, mm -hmm. You know, under $15,000. It's a no brainer watch. That's why I bought it. Uh, I think the people are sleeping on them. I think they're going to regret sleeping on them. Mm -hmm. I think those watches will be $20,000 plus at some point. They are unusual. They're certainly unusual in that condition. Sorry, it's a plug for the Theo and Harris shop, but you know it's the truth. I mean, that watch is legitimately a no-brainer watch, and I think that a lot of people are, you know, not not to be like, oh, you sheep, but a lot of people are so conditioned to be like Daytona or die, Daytona or yeah. die. But it's, it, sh it should be more nuanced, right? It's, you know, you're not comping this to a. Daytona, a regular modern Daytona, mm -hmm. this should be comp to a vintage Daytona that an equivalent would be worth, you know, a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, right? Like, of course it's a Tudor, it's not a Rolex Daytona, right? But I actually think that that's it's kind of one of the reasons it's good. Mm -hmm. It's bigger, it's automatic. It's actually much more wearable for the modern wrist than a vintage Daytona, right? So I think that it's a no-brainer watch, period, and um, and I love that Tudor picked that up. You know, just to give Tudor the props, the you know, the props where they're due, the new Black Bay is cool, mm -hmm. Meta certified, I don't really care about that a ton, <laughs> but it is very cool, um, yeah. The watch on your wrist, unlike your iPad, will mean something to someone one day if it doesn't already. Something that will make them smile, walk a little taller, surely at some point cry, but it will mean something. A few things that I'd love to see Tudor keep up uh, going into 2024 would be uh, number one. I love what they did with the Black Bay with the red bezel. Uh, I'd love to see Jubilee stuff like bracelet, that, the Jubilee yeah. bracelet. Um, I'd love to see something similar of what they did with Harrods, but on their own, that green right. uh, bezeled yep. uh, watch. And then also uh, another thing that I think that they just knocked out of the park in 2023 is the Pelagos. Yeah, they, uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, well, they introduced it in a new size in 39, I believe, and and, and, and even this FXD model is just amazing. They, they've done a really really great job. I mean, they, they go. So this black, is a great watch. I just think that they, th these watches are just very well executed. I, I agree. I, I actually think that the Pelagos, uh, while, while the, well, I think the Tudor beats out tag on the dive watch <laughs> front, I think that the, that, the, that the Black Bay is better than the Aqua Racer, I think the Pelagos is by far their best dive watch. I don't even think it's close. I think the Pelagos kicks kicks the Black Bay's butt, like <laughs> like by a mile, yeah. you know? So, so yeah, period end. I, I agree with you. And then the last thing that I, I would love this 
BBC in, in 2026. It will be 100 years of Tudor. Yep. Uh, and they released some very early um, tank type watches. Yeah. I believe in the 30s, if I have that correct. I actually couldn't find too much information about them. Yeah. But I would love to see a re release of, of a Tudor tank or something, a new spin on it for, yeah. for 2026. I, I know we're a few years away, but. I think it'd be cool, man. That's one of the beautiful things about the Tudor, you know, you know, kind of price point is Tudor could be a brand because they've got the hero. Heritage, mm-hmm. they've got the name to sell to sell guys a great dress watch, like to yeah. sell guys a tank. I mean, I can't tell you how many calls I take, you know, where guys are like, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I really want, I really want a tank, but you know, carnies are a lot of money, you know, but I want a real good brand. It's like, well, someone's got to fill that gap, and Tudor totally could, you know. They've done a really good job with their Black Bay dress line, like the 31, 30, mm-hmm. whatever, all that stuff. Um, I do think that their, some of their other dress watches have fallen a little bit flat, um, but, you know, there's there's a lot of room for upper mobility, Agreed. and a Tudor tank, particularly if they were to do it with a Big Rose, you know, logo, yeah. which is their original logo, mm-hmm. that would be amazing, you know. So I'm really rooting for the brand. I love Tudor. Tudor did a lot to be proud of, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. I just do think that, that Tag Heuer came out this year like you know they just really Strong. busted out of the f-ing gates and just blew it up so you know props to them mm-hmm. and um and i do think they won in 2023 period end agreed that being said this is not a uh, a race this is a marathon and uh, and frankly <laughs> they're they're both going to grow and they're both going to make a lot of money and mm-hmm. all of their executives will do well and 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 that's a great thing because the watch industry will be better served for it right agreed. so it's a great thing right yeah. the competition is is ultimately in the best interest of the watch enthusiast and that's that's the best. I think I couldn't say it better myself. My guy, if you guys enjoyed this video, go ahead and like it and subscribe to our channel. If you'd like more content from Theo and Harris, go ahead to the link down below and sign up for our weekly podcast called The Zero. Our community is incredible over there. We have literally hundreds of members and we post all the time, not just podcasts with industry leaders and with friends and watch collectors, but also behind the scenes posts of Theo and Harris. And, and if you do go ahead and sign up, be sure to shoot me a DM and, and we'll chat you know, over there because I can't answer all the YouTube comments. <laughs> comments, but I can uh, be there uh, for, our, for our little community. So I hope to see you on over there. And that's it. Straps, um, as many of you should know, bring a whole world of potential to mix up your watch collection. They breathe new life into watches. They help you pull out different colors. They, they give them new personality. Straps can be uh, very addictive. I know people with two watches and 10 straps because it adds so many facets to a collection in a, in a fairly you know, easy and fun way. So that's why they become such a part of the Theo and Harris you know, culture and identity. I think we sell more exotic straps than, than almost anybody because I just love them so much. And I love sharing them with you.